And I want to say welcome to each one of you this morning. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to spend some time in worship, and spend some time in the Word, and we're going to spend some time doing some other things. Um, I want to give just a little punch for the uh, Truth Project this morning. I don't know how many of you have heard of World Magazine. I've, uh, I've loved it for about uh, 10 years now. And it uh, brings uh, kind of an overall objective of, of life from a Christian standpoint, looking at world events and so forth. And one of the things in this particular issue, and this is uh, November 29th, uh, talks about something that's very subtly happening in our world. And sometimes it's not so subtle if you know what to be looking for. And this one happens to be uh, something by the Templeton Foundation. How many of you have heard of the Templeton Foundation? I'm sure many of you have. Uh, you've heard of Templeton Funds, if you've done any investing or if you have any interest in the, the financial markets. But Templeton was uh, uh, the papa, the old man who passed away a few years ago, uh, was a, a Presbyterian. And uh, he was a man who declared his faith in Christ. And when he passed away, he left a, a very large estate. And he left his son in charge of it. His son is an evangelical Christian, strong believer. And as he uh, left this estate, and the, the son would like to have done some other things with it, but uh, because dad left it, set up a certain things, Dad left it a kind of a dual thing, and about half of the estate goes to supporting liberal causes. We're religiously liberal, politically liberal, and that's so strange because Templeton was a conservative financially and uh, politically pretty conservative. And he declared himself to be a, a strong, solid, biblical believer. And yet his estate is set up to about half of it to go to support liberal cause, part of it to support the evangelical cause. The liberal part is being used to fund, uh, today anyway, is being used to fund the teaching of evolution in some of our Christian schools in, in the world today. Uh, grants are being given somewhere between uh, uh, $25,000 and $390,000, a grant for one year. And a $390,000 grant would be a very substantial grant for most small colleges, but most of our Christian colleges fit in what's called small college. That's under 20,000 students in a small college. And this grant comes, but it comes with strings attached, and supposedly they are supposed to uh, teach uh, the value of evolution. That's part of the grant's purpose. And, and then along with that, if they want to, they can shuffle in some evangelical creationism. But many of the colleges, because of the way the grant is written, are finding it necessary to try to some way straddle this fence about creation versus evolution. And it's a critical thing that's happening in our world today. It's very subtle. Uh, I don't know if you've watched what's happened to Christian colleges. Uh, uh, some of those, what we call, what I consider a way to be some of the strong colleges over the years, uh, have uh, kind of drifted off of these directions. Biola <coughs> University is one. Long time, you know, Biola, Stanford Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Uh, today it's Biola, it's Biola University and uh, has some things in the curriculum, in the science department, in the philosophy department, in the literature department, things that you and I would not want to have incorporated as part of our, our teaching and part of the things to teach our, our kids. I just got some wind the other day that the Multnomah University in Portland is also had a couple of things moving over into that direction. Very disturbing to me. I'm an alumni of that school. My wife's an alumni of that school. Um, the school that when we went there said, if it's Bible you want, you want Multnomah. And it's been known through the years. There's a very strong foundational position for Bible teaching and it has a seminary and college and so forth. And so we need to be aware of what's happening and then we need to be able to answer those things. That's part of the reasons why we are showing the Truth Project. And I'd like to encourage each one of you to come downstairs and, and participate with us in that. Uh, we have scheduled to begin it today at 1.30, but there have been some uh, questions and suggestions, and we might move that up a little bit. But there's food down there, and I don't mean there's some nibblies, and I don't mean there's enough to kind of get you by until you can get home. There's food down there today. And I invite you to come down and join with us, and. Uh, 
uh, participate and then stick around for the Truth Project. It's a 13-week series. I would uh, hope that you could come into all of it, but uh, come into as much of it as you can. And I'm going to copy this uh, article and have it out for you. Uh, it's uh, four, five, six pages in here. It's called Inter Interpretive Dance. And uh, uh, it's very well written, well done, and I want to have you take a look at that. Second thing I want to say is we're continuing our series on stewardship, and this morning we're going to talk about that word of tithing. You know, can you say it? Tithing. Can you say 10%? 10%. Tithe means 10%. You know, we, we talk about often as we pray for the offering, uh, bless the tithes and offerings. And I think that probably is a misnomer because many of us don't put in a tithe, we, we put in a tip instead of a tithe. And the offering, technically, biblically, doesn't begin until after the tithe is paid. So we're going to ask you to uh, give generously. And I want to say along that line, you have been very generous in your giving. We, we thank you for your giving. Thank you for the way you have... Uh, uh, work with us and support us. Thank you for your prayer support. God is doing some things in our fellowship and and he's opening some hearts and he's opening some lives and we have prayed for this, we have worked for this for years and we have overcome a lot of obstacles. Uh, Bethel went through some really difficult years, some, some desert years that were very hard and uh, God is beginning to open the doors and, and pour some blessing on Bethel and so I, I'm, I'm so I'm uh, thankful for each one of you, and I, I trust that you will continue to pray with us, um, pray for us, pray with us, uh, participate with us, uh, discuss with us, and whenever I can be a part of that conversation with you, I would love to do that. Okay, let's take a minute to pray. Skip, if you can uh, get Rick and uh, come and receive the offering this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunities you give us. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, thank you for enabling us to earn. And now thank you for enabling us to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. We worship you today and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today, uh, I'm supposed to read Matthew 6, 19 through 33. Uh, this should be about Matthew, and chapter 6, and it deals with the treasures of heaven. Um, not to worry. And basically, it's, a, it's the first book in the New Testament. You know, it's written by Matthew. Matthew was a Jew. And he wrote it primarily to the Jewish audience that he was writing. So I think it'd be apropos for me to give you the Jewish blessing. But this is this is the Hebrew letter for God. And this is what they would do their services when they would start. It says, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you. The Lord will talk his countenance upon you. That's basically how they would start their services because they uh, would prefer to show in a physical nature as opposed to speaking the word. The word of God, they couldn't speak God. When you look in the Hebrew Bible, it's like G blank D, and they couldn't say God, so they developed about 12 different names that they could use for this, and you'll find them through the scripture. But that said, this is what Matthew wrote to primarily to the Jewish audience. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And you cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or what your body what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet the Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you worry can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the valley grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So do not worry about saying, What shall I eat? What shall I drink? Or what shall I wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first the kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble to its own. That's some heavy stuff when you think of the reality we live in the real world. Thank you. Thank you for reading. How many of you live in the real world? Yeah, that's what I thought. All of you do. And uh, I've had a conversation with a couple different people this morning about the storms that have gone on this week. And I'm not talking about the rain and the wind. I'm talking about the storms that happen in our life, the everyday process that's going on. We, we deal with that. We live through them. We work through them. We're in the process of doing things that God lays before us every day. Some of those things are funny and some are not so funny. I've got a little uh, piece of humor here that uh, I first read when I was a teenager and I uh, thought about it again the other day and I, as I'm thinking about the, uh, the series of, of giving and stewardship in our life and so on, I thought this would be worthwhile. So we, uh, uh, when I say we, my wife went on uh, the internet and pulled this up because I have a little book full of poems written by Phil Kerr and I were collected by him and this is one of them, but I couldn't find the book. So uh, Rita went on and found out there's a half a dozen Phil Kerr's, two more Phil Kerr evangelists, but not this one. So we did find the, 
the little poem here I want to share with you. It's uh, called The Dollar and the Cent. Big brown dollar and little brown cent, rolling along together they went, rolling down a smooth sidewalk when the dollar remarked, for the dollar can talk, you poor little cent, you cheap little mite. I'm bigger and twice as bright, and I'm worth more than you a hundredfold. And written on me in letters bold is a motto drawn from the pious creed, in God we trust, which all may read. And the penny said, yes, I know. I'm a cheap little mite, and I know I'm not big and I'm not bright nor good, nor great. And yet, the saint said, with a meek little sigh, you don't go to church as often as I. <laughs> <laughs> so as we, uh, as we look at the scriptures today, um, we need to keep that kind of in our, on our mind and our head. Um, I said in the introduction for the offering this morning that we sometimes tip God instead of up time. You know, most of us go out to eat quite a bit. That's one of the, uh, especially for, for Christians, it seems to be one of the proverbial recreational habits. We we put it in and wear it on the belt the rest of our life. They say food is uh, 30 seconds in the mouth, two hours in the stomach, the rest of your life in your hips. And uh, we are kind of, uh, kind of live with that and most of us represent that and we uh, we have fun putting it on and then we don't have fun taking it off but both exercises we do have to work ourselves through but we sometimes uh, actually give more in a tip to the a waiter or waitress as the case might be than we do to God um, you know the tip is an interesting thing it was initiated because in the frontier days as people were coming west particularly and they would give a they'd be in a hurry or whatever and, and they would would tip the waitress as a way to say please speed things up if you can that was where the tip originated and it's de deteriorated or grown as the case might be to the place where our waiters or waitresses depend on the tips for a big part of their income today and so we tip them according to the service that they give us, according to the generosity of our heart. But we typically tip 15 to 20 percent. And yet as we sit down to determine our amount of giving to the Lord, and we kind of say, well, 10 percent is a lot of money. And can I give that much or should I give that much or whatever? And so as we look at Scripture and see what it would say to us and tell us to talk to us about, that's an interesting place for us to get our thinking started. Where, where does the tip begin and where does the tithe begin? If we look at the Old Testament, the tithe, we talk about it being a 10% tithe, but tithing and Old Testament structure actually ranges up someplace between 25 and 30% of the income that the people earn. Because there was a, just right off the top, there was a 10% tithe that God asked him to give. And then there was a tithe on the crops, and there's a tithe on this, and there's a tithe on this, and a gift in here, and a gift here. And these gifts were to be given generously and of a heartfelt expression of worship. And yet those, those offerings were relegated and demanded as the tithe or the, the offering is to be this much. We think of an offering being whatever you feel like giving. But the, the Old Testament talked about it and said the tithe and the and the offering is to be this much, and so forth. But as we look at the uh, the matter of giving in the New Testament, and some would say tithing is not a scriptural pattern in the New Testament. But you know, there's no place in the New Testament that tithing is something that, that we are told we don't follow through anymore. There's never any writing in any of the early church history where they did not uh, adhere to and commend the tithe as a step of beginning of the giving to the Lord. And so this morning, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with you about what is and what isn't a tithe. The tithe, it means 10%. And uh, as God set it down in the scripture, that 10% was to be 10% uh, of the income that came in. Your earnings, your assets, uh, whether it came in from investment, whether it came in from uh, the crops or whatever it was, 10% of that. You had 
10 animals that were born to you during the year, you dedicated one of those, you gave one of those to God. And, uh, or if you had uh, um, a hundred bushel of wheat that you came in, then out of the hundred bushel you gave 10 to the Lord. And uh, so 10% is 10%. Uh, mathematics is one of the things that uh, is still pretty real. It's uh, pretty cut and dry. If it's 5%, it's 5%. If it's 10%, it's 10%. And 10% doesn't mean 7 cents or 8 cents. 10% means 10 cents. So as we look at the uh, scriptures, the question we have is, the assets that are ours, we call them ours, the assets that God has given to us, are they ours or do they belong to God and he's put us in the management of those? And last week we looked at the uh, passage in Matthew 25 where the parable was given, Jesus one of the parables he gave about the man who was going to go to a far country and he brought three of his, his uh, aides beside him, three of his servants beside him. And he said to the one guy, here's 10 talents or here's 10 bags of silver. I want you to uh, take care of this until I come back. And to another one, he said, here's five bags of silver. I want you to take care of this till I get back. And to the other, he said, here's one bag of silver. I want you to take care of it till I get back. And so the guy came back, and the guy with the ten bags came back, and he said to the master, here's ten bags, and here's ten more. I invested it, and I expanded it, I worked it, and here's ten more. And the guy who had five bags came up, and he said, here's the five that you gave me, and here are five more. I've worked it, and expanded it, and it's more. And the guy who had one bag came back, and he said, I knew that you were an unjust and a hard man to work for, and you... So here's your bag of silver. I took it and buried it, and here it is. So the first two guys, the uh, the landowner, the man, the manager said, the owner said to the guy with ten, "Bless you. I rejoice with you." And actually, in some of the uh, new translations of scripture, and if you look back into the original languages of scripture, he actually said, "Let's celebrate together." Now, just think of that for a minute. He said to the guy, "Here's your ten bags of silver." Take care of it until I get back. And we don't read between the lines. What he said was, manage this, stretch it, grow it, multiply it until I get back. And so the owner comes back and he said to the guy with the five bags, the guy with the, one, with the ten bags, he said, uh, let's celebrate together. Let's, let's rejoice together. Now I want you to just think about that for a little bit. God has given you whatever you have today, and he wants it to grow and multiply and expand. He has given it to us to manage and to grow. Now, take a look back in your scripture, and I would encourage you to turn back Genesis chapter 39. It's the story of Joseph, and he's in the house of Potiphar, and uh, as he's uh, uh, being propositioned there by Potiphar's wife, and uh, the fact that we want to pull out of this uh, passage of Scripture, Genesis 39, is that, that Joseph said to Potiphar's wife, your, your husband has put everything under my control. Everything except you are under my management and my control, and you are not because you are his wife. And I could not do this dreadful thing you're propositioning me with. And you can read the rest of the story there, but Joseph was the manager of everything that Potiphar had. And he ultimately became the manager of everything that was in the land of Egypt. Now as you think in, in chapter 39, uh, just follow through a little bit about Joseph's activity. For example, in verse last part of verse 20, while Joseph was in prison, even there he was the manager of what went on in the prison. Or if you back up, I think it's verse 20 or something like that. Uh, I don't have it marked here. Anyway, it, he was the manager. It was his responsibility to grow it. Now, Egypt was going to go through a famine. They were going to have seven years of famine. And uh, Joseph was there to manage and manipulate the, the food so that the people could have food to eat during those seven years of famine. And Joseph had collected it and managed it and it grew it just in, in outstanding ways. 
So much so that uh, they, they didn't have a place to store the grain. They didn't have a place to take care of it. And so he added places and built places, but he was managing it for the growth. Now, turn that around, and let's talk about our own assets and resources today. And this was a wake-up call to me. You know, a few years ago, I, uh, quote, retired from my day job. And then three months later, I took another day job. And uh, then a year later, I retired from that day job. And at the same day I retired from that, I took another day job. And so, I, you know, I've kind of said, well, you know, you're retired. You're supposed to be retired. You think you're retired. Some people think you're retired. Something in that is where the truth really comes out. The truth is, I'm still going pretty, pretty much like I always have. My kids get on me and say, Dad, when are you going to retire? And I say to them, when are you going to retire? And, uh, well, they're probably more ready to do it than I am, but that's, that's immaterial. But it just kind of dawned on me that I should be growing my resources and my assets today just like I was trying to grow them when I had a day job. That's my responsibility. It doesn't mean I have to have the same amount of return. You see, Jesus didn't, uh, didn't particularly give extra accolades to the guy who got 10 bags of silver from the 10 bags or the guy who got five bags from the one who had five bags. He didn't say to the guy with 10, boy, you're, you're a better investor than your partner is. They, they were both commended because of what they did. What are you doing today with your assets and resources and how are they being used? Now, I don't think it's uh, up to us to just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate so that I can walk around to people and I can say, well, I've got this, I've got that, I've got something else, whatever it is. I got a thing on the internet uh, a while back about this guy who has a, a collection of antique and, and collectible cars in Arizona. He has 7,000 collectible cars. What do you do with 7,000 cars? Well, you, you take pictures of them and you send them around the world and you take them out on your little driving track. He has a a 30 mile driving track and he takes them out. You know, some of these are, are very, quote, uh, hot cars. They, they've got lots of horsepower, lots of energy, and uh, can do lots of things. And uh, so what do you do with them? You talk about them, you gloat about them, I've got them, you don't. Have you got one like this or whatever? The other night I was kind of spinning the channel, see what was out there, and I happened to get onto a, a place where um, a guy was rebuilding cars. A couple of you guys in here do that and have done it. And they bought a piece of junk called the 1960 Impala Chevrolet. And they put it back together and, and polished it up. And, uh, and it, was, it was beautiful. I mean, it was beautiful. And it had a lot of power. It had a lot of nice lines and beautiful. And the guy got 70,000 bucks out of the car when he sold it. And uh, in that, he made himself $28,000. That was what the show was about. Then the next one that came up was an auction that takes place in Tempe, Arizona, or Scottsdale, Arizona, every year. And here are the collectibles that come from all over the world that come in. And uh, they, had a, they had a 1940 Ford pickup. Now, the only thing that was 1940 Ford pickup was the shell. But it was beautiful. But I couldn't believe it. This sucker sold for $390,000. Now, what do you do with that? You, you talk about it. I've got it, you don't. I have a car that you don't. I have this, and you couldn't have it. All these kind of things. Now, we sometimes handle our assets that way. Every one of us are guilty of that. I've got this, you don't. I have this kind of a house, you don't. I have that kind of a car, you don't. I have whatever it is. Now we collect antiques, and antiques are fun to collect. I've got a few antiques around, but I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna worship those antiques. I've got an antique desk, probably something out of the 1910, 1920 outside, a banker's desk, and uh, you know, it's, to me, it's a desk. I, I work there, I have some books on it, I have a computer sitting beside it, I have some stuff in the drawers. I just wish it had more drawers like a modern desk do. But it, it's nice to have, it's beautiful, it has some usefulness to me. But you know what, I'm not married to that desk. 
If somebody wants it and the price is right, come and get it and exchange it for cash. Be glad to do that. Now, as we think about those kind of things, as if it's a treasure and I look at it as my wealth, that means I am talking about, I'm bragging about it, it's for me to talk about, to show off, and so on. But if it's a trust, and as we move it to a trust, it moves into a liquid asset, a trust is something that I am to be a manager of. So everything that I have, everything that you have, this, this goes through your, your household. I don't care what it is, you, you go through and take your own inventory as you see it. And it's there for you to manage and to use for the glory of God. That's what God, that's why God has given it to us. It's his. We are managing it. Now granted, Joseph, as he managed the resources of Egypt and grew them and multiplied them, he received a lot of the benefits of it. Now if you have a business or if you have uh, whatever you have, uh, you work that and you manage it and you grow it and the assets are there, but they, they belong to God, they belong to the business, they, they're only yours to use as you multiply them and grow them and put them into useful places. Now as we think of, of those kind of things, you enjoy the benefits of those just as anybody else does. Okay, let's, let's move it up. I, I have a business. I don't really, but let's just say I did. I, had a business. I have a business. And in that business, I'm growing it and I'm expanding it. I built some assets and I've invested those assets and they've multiplied and grown. I bought some new resources and they have multiplied and grown. And yes, I have advantage of those. I get to live a little different lifestyle because I have them. I get to, uh, to use them or to give them or whatever I might want to do with them. God allows me that privilege, but it really doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. You know, I have a friend who told me one time, and I think about it a lot. He said, I've, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Yeah. So when, when we check out of this world, we're going to leave it all. Or the statement about the, the wealthy man who died, and somebody said, how much did you leave? And they said, he left it all. He left it all. And so we have it to use and to take care of. Now both my wife and I have gone through that pleasant, painful experience. Our parents have passed away. They left a, a little bit of a nest egg and both of us happened to get the privilege and responsibility of being the executor or the administrator of the estate. And uh, that came to us and says, you divide it this way, you spend it that way, and you take care of this, and so on and so forth. Now, we got a portion of that, but we didn't get it all. We had the responsibility of divvying it up. We were told how to use it. We are told how to disperse it. Now, as you think about those kind of things, a trust says it's yours, and you have an obligation to follow through and to manage it. Now, Joseph was a manager of the land of Egypt. And God talks about managers, stewards, in various places in Scripture. In Matthew 25, uh, we saw the three stewards. Two of them did well. One of them didn't do well. So what does God say about our money? And I just translated money, our assets. I just translated all of that into liquid assets. It's called M-O-N-E-Y. So... You know, sometimes when you do an estate, you have to transfer some of the valuables into liquid or into money. Had to sell a house. Had to sell a car. I've never, I've never desired, never owned a Cadillac, but my mom had one, and she didn't like it, and uh, she wanted it sold, and so she said, "Sell it for me." So I drove it to Portland, and I sold it. it was, it was three years old and had 8,000 miles on it. And uh, I was selling it. And it was interesting, uh, the guy who bought it, he came to the house, looked at it. And uh, at that time, the car had a, an appraised value, a sale appraised value, $27,500. And, and the guy who gave me the appraisal said, uh, well, I'd start out at $28,000, and then I'd dicker with him a little bit. And so I did. And the guy came 
over to the house one night and looked at it, and he said, yeah, I think we'll buy that. And he said, uh, we just settled on the price of $27,500. And as he was walking out the door, he said, I'll come back tomorrow and, and pick it up. I said, I'd like to have a certified check. And he kind of rolled his eyes at me, and he said, would you rather have that than cash? I said, no, I'll take cash. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy came over the next night with a brown paper bag, folded up under his arm, except it was brown, it was kind of like that, just stuck it under his arm, and walked in, come into my kitchen table, and start counting out $27,500 in $50 and $100 bills. And I kind of looked at it, and his wife said, it was a second marriage, and interesting story there, but she said, well, this is not the biggest cash purchase he's made. I saw him buy a farm up in, in uh, Goldendale for $250,000 cash. Now, he transferred into cash. What did God say about money? What did, he, what did he say? If you look through the parables on money, where God talked about it, or Jesus spoke about it in the New Testament, if you look at money throughout the Old Testament, what did God reward about the resources that he gave people? Number one, he said, money is not evil. Paul said to Timothy, it is not money that's evil, it's the love of money that's, that's evil. If, you're, if you've got it just to, just to lavish on it, just to relish on it, just to brag about it, just to desire it, then that's where the evil <coughs> part of money comes in. In other words, money is not an evil thing. Not at all. Money is to be traded and used and invested and grown and developed. Or go back to the early days of the creation when God put Adam and Eve in the garden and he gave them the responsibility of the garden and he said, have dominion over it. That's another way to say to Adam and Eve, manage it. Cultivate it, develop it, enjoy the fruit, use it as a place to live, manage it. Third thing God says about money is to grow it. As you look at the creation story, they were to grow the fruits and the vegetables and so forth, and later on the animals, and they were to do this to feed themselves and to provide a living and a livelihood for themselves. That was their privilege and responsibility. Have dominion over it, manage it, grow it. So as we look at the scripture then, God says about money, I want you to trade with it. I want you to have dominion, control of it. I want you to grow it. I want you to expand it. I want you to multiply it. So what are we trying to say about our money? You know, there's two ways to brag about what you have and don't have. I talked about the one who said, you know, he's got 7,000 cars, and he wants to make people impressed with how much he has and how great they are and so forth. That's one kind of bragging about what you have. There's another kind of brag. There's a kind that says, well, I don't have this, and I'm more spiritual than you are because I didn't spend my money on those kinds of things. I'm, I'm better than you are because I have taken a vow of poverty. Now, some of us never took a vow, we just live in poverty, but we don't go around bragging about it. We're not happy with it. So we can, we can, we can be foolish about bragging what we, how little we have, or we can talk about be bragging about how much we have, and both of those are just another side of the same coin, and they're both wrong. So what am I trying to say about money? I, I want to not say it's my money, it's my barns, it's my assets. Yes, it is, in a sense, in an earthly sense, in a worldly sense, it is mine. I am responsible for it. But you know, one of these days, I'm gonna check out of this place. And, and when I check out, I'm going to leave it all. I'm not going to take any of it with me. And who am I going to live, give it to? Well, if my wife is still alive, she gets it. If we're both gone, my kids get it. And a church gets it. And a couple organizations get it. But uh, we're not going to take it with us. We're just not going to take it with us. So what am I trying to say about money today? Number one, I want to say that it belongs to God. I want to say that I want to invest it and use it and grow it and multiply it. I want to live off the residual of it. I want to have this usable and I want to glorify God. And then what do I want to say about God's control of it? Now I think it's a responsibility for me to live within uh, my means, a, a reasonable place of the means with which I have. 
And uh, I think it's more important for me to not see how lavish I can live, but rather to see how much I could do with my resources beyond my living expense. Now, if you don't know, you, uh, I, I worked for a logger one time, and he was talking about his tractor was an older tractor, and uh, his car was an older car, and, and he kept talking about that, and said, oh, yeah, he said, I'd, I'd like to have a new tractor, and I'd like to have a new this, but he said, you know, then I'd have to pay for those, and I'd rather do some other things with it than to buy those kind of things. One writer said, high standard of living takes a high standard of spending. So where is the level of the balance of living and spending where you are comfortable with what God provides for you? There's a recorded conversation between Will Rogers and John D. Rockefeller. And at that time, Will Rogers was probably one of the most uh, uh, famous philosophers and comedians of that generation. And John D. Rockefeller was uh, at that time known as the wealthiest man in the world. He was the Bill Gates of that day. And Rogers and, and uh, uh, they, they had, a, had a relationship. They, they knew each other and they had some things together in common. Now, Rockefeller did some great things with his money. I was in a church that he essentially funded to have built up in Troy, New York, Troy Town, New York, a nice building. And uh, he, his money built it. There was pretty much everybody in town knew that. But uh, Roger said to John D. that day, he said, John, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And John thought about it a minute and he said, well, I guess it takes just a little more. Just a little bit more. Now, if we're going to idolize things, it will always take a little bit more. I remember talking to a Youth of Christ evangelist one time. He was a single man, and he had a beautiful car. And I said, yeah, I said, because I don't have a family to support, I can afford a beautiful car. And the other fellow that was with us in this three-way conversation, and he said, but you don't have much uh, fellowship and gentleness and kindness and tenderness and emotional connection with, uh, with the car. In other words, if you had a family, you would have a relationship there. So, you know, you can jingle a few coins in your pocket. You can fold up a few dollar bills and put them in your wallet. You can invest your money in a bank. You can invest them in resources. You can buy property with them. You can run businesses with them. And that is all good. I'm not putting any of that down. I, I want you to do that. I, I hope you enjoy doing that. But you want it to grow. You want it to develop and multiply and grow. So what does my, my life say about God's control of my money? Some of you have heard the name of Jim Elliott. You probably have heard about Elizabeth Elliot, more recent. Jim Elliot was uh, uh, killed in Ecuador in 1956. There were five guys that were trying to reach the Aka Indians, and they thought they had built some rapport with them, and they went into one of their tribal areas to do some evangelism, and, and the Indians came and and massacred the whole bunch of them, all five of them. And Jim Elliott was one of those guys. Now, all those guys were pretty premium guys, very premium guys. Jim Elliott apparently did more writing and pinning down some of his things than some of the other guys did. Here is one of his famous quotes. His quote is, <clears throat> Lord, make my way prosperous, not that I can achieve a higher station, but that my life can be an exhibit to the value of knowing God. Another one of his famous statements was, he is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. And that was his philosophy of life. 
give his life, invested in the kingdom of God, growing the kingdom of God, which no one could take that away from him and could not take it away from God. Now, Jim Elliott uh, could have probably been a pretty wealthy man if he'd not gone into missions. He was, he was brilliant. He was a good manager. He was a gifted man. He could have been a very well endowed man. But instead of that, he took his life to the mission field and buried it there. Or think about another missionary, probably one of the most famous missionaries of all times was, uh, was William Carey, a man from England. As uh, growing up in the early days of his life, he was a shoe cobbler, which was a respectable position in that, in that day. But he had the burning desire to go to India and to take the gospel to India. And he kept thinking about that and talking about that and preparing for that. And one day some guy got angry with him and said, William, stop it. If God wants a people in India to come to Christ, he'll take them to Christ without you. you don't, he doesn't need you. And Carey said, I want to go. And William Carey wound up going to India. Hardship after hardship. Lost his wife. Uh, lost one of his family. Uh, went through some extreme hardships there, health-wise and so forth. But he continued to preach and proclaim and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he left, he left a group of believers who knew Christ. You know, if William Carey had continued to pound out shoes, he would have made a good living. He would probably have been a respected businessman in town. But I doubt if history would have written anything about William Carey. But because he invested his life there, people know who William Carey is. We could go through and we could name other men like that. We could take about, talk about uh, Dwayne L. Moody, one of the famous evangelists of the uh, early 20th century in the United States. He said that he, he was uh, a man that if he could have stood in the middle of the Atlantic and he would have put one hand on Europe and one hand on the United States because he had been so effective in this evangelism in these two continents. Moody was a shoe salesman, aggressive salesman, moving up in the company. That's how he wanted going to Chicago from, I think it was Pennsylvania. They transferred him to Chicago. You're such a great salesman. Go out there and develop a big market. And he did. But as he went to Chicago, he also started building a Sunday school. And in the process of that, he, he saw many people coming to Christ. And he went down into the ghettos of Chicago and he, he would win people to Christ and he'd get them into a Sunday school and he just spent his life doing that. A one little guy was walking across Chicago one day and a guy, they called him a skeptic, said to the little guy, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Moody Sunday School. I don't know if you've been to Chicago, but in the wintertime, it's cold in Chicago. I didn't, I've been there a few times. I didn't see anything in Chicago that I want to go back for. But this little kid was walking through Chicago. It was cold. And the guy said, where are you going? Moody Sunday School. Why are you going over there? You pass a half a dozen good churches. Why don't you just stop at one of them instead of going through the cold? The little kid stopped for a minute and he said, I think it's because over there they love a guy. And Moody had an impacting ministry on the city of Chicago. Such a strong impact that he had more to say about some of the developments in Chicago than, than people who were in the political circle. Moody left a, a whole trail of ministries where he had invested his life for the kingdom of God. Moody Bible Institute, Moody Church in Chicago, a printing house, uh, a lot of things, a lot of things that he left that started because he invested his life. What is my life? What is your life saying for God today? Where are we investing our life? What are we doing that says to God, when I'm gone, you can take my reputation and you can grow it any way you want to. But in the meantime, let me live it so that it says that you have been running my life. I saw a quote that I wanted to share with you. It said, take gold out of the center of your life and put God there. In other words, take assets out of the center of our life and put God there. We are, we are here to manage assets, not to be managed by assets. What do we have when we, when we tithe? What, what do we gain? 
Well, I want to just give you just a quick uh, quote from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Now, just a little historical background. Israel has been through a long time of not really living for God. They've just barely come out of, of uh, captivity. And uh, they're still following after the law of paganism and a lot of um, things that were not honoring to God. And, uh, and they were still not having their needs met and so on and so forth. And God gave them this, this statement, Malachi 3 and verse 10. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. What was God talking about? He was talking about physical resources. But you know what else he was talking about? He's talking about their relationship to him. So my giving ought to be that which builds a relationship between me and God. So I've got a few things there in your handout you can look at. What, what does my tithing, what, what I say with my tithing? One is, my tithing is not so much for God as it is for me. God doesn't need my money. He doesn't. But he gives me the privilege of giving my money and having a relationship with him through that giving. Therefore, it's not for me. I'm, I'm pardon me, it's not so much for God. It is me, the, the privilege of giving. Builds a relationship between me and God. Secondly, it puts God first in things. Put God first in my things. And then when I put him first in my things, other things begin to grow and to develop. Throughout scripture, you'll notice those who are honoring God with the giving of first fruits and giving generously to God are the ones that God blessed with a generous reputation for them and a relationship with God. The third thing is, tithing proves God's promise. And I can testify, and I'm sure some of you can testify, if you want to get in trouble financially, just back off and you're giving. And right away you can get in trouble. Continue your giving and watch God put things together for you. Piece by piece, step by step, God will put things together for you. Another thing we're seeing, tithing sets my attention on spiritual things because when I take that 10% out of my income and resources, what I'm really saying to God is, God, take this and use it and bless what I have left. And you know what God does? He replaces what I have given and he lets these other resources begin to be used to develop and honor him and things around him. Now, a while ago, we took an offering here. And we put money in the plate. Some of us put checks in. Some of you put cash in. It doesn't matter. We take it to the bank. They have a way to transfer that all into usable assets for the ministry of this church. Some of it goes to support missionaries. Some of it goes to support the gospel here. Some of it goes for advertising to say to people who are not here, want you to come and see. Come in here. Come and see what God can do. Visit with us. Get to know God like we know him. Worship him like we worship him. And then there's another thing that happens when I give to God. It makes me a partner with God. See, when I give something and I see it grow and multiply, it's a privilege to see that. During our ministry career, Beach and I had the privilege of helping uh, start about 125 churches in the Northwest. And uh, we made some investment in that. Uh, we supported most of those guys. We took them on personal support for a three-year time. And uh, so as we look at their ministry, we can say, you know, part of that's what I got to have a part with God. I think of, uh, of three of them. One of them is a guy over in Hermiston, Oregon, a little town, you know. At the time, Hermiston was just a place where the tumbleweed stopped because there was a fence or something that stopped them. Today, Hermiston is kind of a thriving little business community, but Dave and Sheila went to that community and we supported Dave and Sheila. We knew Sheila's dad for a long time. And uh, we supported them so much a month for a while. And they took a handful of people and they had grown that handful of people. Today, it's a church of about 15 or 1,800 people in this little town in Hermiston. You know, as I drive by, I see the building 
or if I were to go in and sit there and worship and look at the people there, and I could say, not in a gloating way, but say, thank God, I had a part in reaching you. I had a part in helping you come to Christ. I had a part in putting your marriage back together. I had a part in helping you raise your kids. Because I partnered with that guy when he was building that church. I partnered with God in that process. The other one I think of is, is uh, Ken, <clears throat> Ken Mitchell in Maple Valley, Washington. And when Ken went out there, he, he said to me, it's a four garage neighborhood. That was his way of saying it's just a wealthy neighborhood. And he has been successful in reaching a lot of people that have a lot of resources. And that church has done a lot of ministry. They support an orphanage and a hospital and a school in Sierra Leone, where the Ebola thing is taking its toll today. They have been in there for about 10 years with the gospel. There are about a dozen or more churches in there that they have helped to fund. And that came, and I, I'm a, I get to be a part of that. I partnered with God for that because I supported Ken and Valerie Beecher. I supported them while I started that church in just embryonic days with first three or four people and then a dozen people and then 50 people and then continued to grow. And today it's a church of about six, 700 people and has a worldwide ministry. I get to be, I'm part of that. I, I partnered with God. Peter and I partnered with God. And so we get to share in that. And the other is our son. We, we supported him in a church plant. And they have reached people out of all kinds of every. These churches all have a different kind of ministry. Our son's church is, is not in the four garage neighborhood. His is in the, almost a ghetto of Kent, Washington. And they're reaching people that are druggies, they're alcoholics, they're people whose lives have been torn apart, slammed, drugged up and down the street, made fun of, ridiculed, and he's proclaimed Christ to these people. And one by one, they've come to Christ, and they've worshiped God, and they've become different people. One of the guys was so interesting to me, the first day that uh, uh, they had their, their grand opening, and this, this, this guy came in, and he was a pathetic sight. He had chains everywhere, and he had piercings and tattoos, where he probably weighed 50 pounds less if he'd taken the jewelry out of his body. And, and he was high on drugs, because he was a drug dealer. And he lived across the street from where they started, and he decided, you go there and check it out. And he went over and checked it out. And in a few weeks, he came to know Christ. And as he came to know Christ, he began to grow and to develop and mature. A year and a half later, he was the worship leader of that church. And I, I get to rejoice because I had a part in that guy having a changed life. Because I partnered with God in the starting of that church ministry. Now, where are you partnering with God? And what are we, you know, how are we praying for God to change things and do things different? And that's, that's why I'm asking you, as we give here, pray with us. And thank you for your gift. Thank you for your offerings. Thank you for your tithe. Thank you for fellowshipping. Thank you for praying. But pray with us that God will give us the opportunity to see some people come to Jesus. Pray with us that we'll be able to see some some families put back together. Pray with us and we'll be able to see some young people that are wandering around, walking around, and saying, what is God going to do with me? To pray with them to a place where they actually be begin to get a hold of the things God wants them to do and become what God wants them to be. Now, I told you about Jim Elliott. You know, as growing up boy, he was recognized as a good kid, a nice guy, but he was just a boy. And he went through that time in his life. What does God want me to do? Is it business, finance? Is it real estate? Is it missions? And God led him in missions. And the result of that was he went to the Aka Indians. And today that, that whole tribe, essentially that whole tribe has come to Christ because he and these other five guys went down there to invest their life. So tithing is not for you. And the fact that what you give, that's not what it is. It's, it's not to please, it's not to, it's not because God needs your money. Tithing is because I want to partner with God. Partnering with God, I want fellowship with God, I want intimacy with God, I want God's presence, I want God's help, I want his fellowship. And so I give 
because I'm partnering with God and I want to honor him with it. This morning as we close our service, I've asked Janet to, to lead us in uh, worship again and uh, the song that we sang earlier today. And I think you will enjoy it. And so, Janet, if you want to come and Lord, I thank you for the privilege of partnering with you. I thank you for the privilege of being a child of God. I thank you for the privilege of having a nice home and having uh, good transportation and nice clothes and plenty of food and lots of fellowship and lots of people that we know and have time together with them. But God, above everything else, thank you. Thank you that you walk with me and I get the privilege of walking with you. So Lord, thank you. Continue to bless our partnership. Help me to grow in that partnership. Help these friends of mine here today to grow in that partnership with you. Help us to love you more. Help us to love you in a greater way every day. Lord, we love you and we worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing um, just the first and the chorus of him as you are, if you want to pull that out of your bulletin. Come out of sadness from where you've been. Please join us downstairs. We have lots of food. So we'll see you downstairs.